Well, across the country, uh, what we're seeing now is that the virus is peaking in, in many areas. So for instance, in New York now, we're about at the peak, profound illness, uh, patients in the ICU, and, and even the number of deaths. And you know, one of the things that we're hoping to do is avoid uh, what's happened in, in New York in New Jersey uh, and other parts of the country. So right now the estimates are there are about half a million uh, cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. with roughly uh, half of that in New York and New Jersey, uh, 20,000 deaths and about 10,000 of those in, in New York and New Jersey. With regards to Texas, Texas is a bit behind on the peak. And what that means is that we're expecting uh, that the number of cases will not peak at least for another couple of weeks. So we're probably looking at the very beginning of May uh, when we see our maximum number of, of cases and deaths. I'm very worried about where we'll be in the next couple of weeks in, in Houston and Texas. And that's why when there's discussions now nationally about whether to relax social distancing. When I'm being asked my opinion, I'm saying, look, it's going to be too soon to do this because we haven't even reached our peak in Texas for the next couple of weeks. And so we have to ride this out uh, a bit longer. I think for the next couple of weeks here in Houston and Texas, we're in for a rough ride. I think we will expect to see the number of cases in the hospitals of our Texas Medical Center to accelerate. I'm also very quite concerned about the African American and Hispanic communities because of their, not only their inability to do social distancing in low income neighborhoods, but also the high underlying rates of diabetes, hypertension, and renal disease, which we know is an important risk factor for severe illness and death. So one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is uh, how to avoid the health disparity aspect of COVID-19, meaning while everybody is at risk, uh, those living in low-income neighborhoods and those people of color are a particular risk of severe illness and death. Social distancing is important because we, we do not have a lot of technologies yet to apply to this problem. So we have a now a number of diagnostic tests, which are great for monitoring this and looking at the increase in, in the number of cases, but in terms of therapeutics or preventatives like vaccines, we don't have that yet. So the only approach that we, that's proven to work is to separate people away from each other in order to decrease the likelihood of transmission. And we're learning that this is a very transmissible transmissible virus unfortunately so we know social distancing is working so right now social distancing is our major approach towards controlling the covid epidemic covid 19 epidemic uh, in the united states but that will go hand in hand with uh revving up and expanding and accelerating diagnostic testing and Let's just talk a minute about the diagnostic testing that we're going to be have, we're, we're going to have to do. Um, what right now the one most actively being pursued is to is to measure for active infection. That is to sample the what we call the nasopharynx, the mouth and the nose, the throat of people who might be actively infected to see if they right now have the virus, and that's very important to do all types of contact tracing. But in, in addition, we're going to see some additional diagnostic technologies roll out. One of them is antibody testing. And, and the reason that's important is that measures previous exposure to the virus and knowing that individuals have uh, acquired an immune response to it. And, uh, and, and that's useful because more likely than not, those individuals are probably gonna turn out to be protected against getting reinfection. Finally, there's a third type of uh, a diagnostic testing, which uh, sometimes known as syndromic surveillance. And this is a population-wide estimates of where the virus is heading next based on the fact that we're seeing increases in the number of people with fever or cough. And as we slowly try to reopen the economy, it'll be really important to have that kind of syndromic surveillance 
to know if the virus is, is reappearing in certain areas and whether we have to then uh, go back to social distancing in those kind of communities. Well, you know, the Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci from the, the National Institutes of Health has said, you know, I think it's unrealistic to expect that we're going to get back to where we were before we had COVID-19. So the term back to normal has to be put into some kind of quotations because it's really back to a situation where people can go feel comfortable going back to work and going to restaurants and, and that sort of thing. I think right now we may be looking at some list lifting of the social distancing uh, in the coming weeks in Houston and Texas. Certainly you can't do it now while things are still peaking uh, in our part of the country, probably peaking by May 1st. But as you head through the month of May, there may be some options to lift some of the, those social distancing restrictions. And then we're going to have to follow it uh, over the course of the, of the next few months and, and, and make certain, when well, number one, that the virus doesn't come back because we've listed, lifted social distancing. So that has to be followed. And the possibility that it could come back in regular waves over the next two or three years. You know, as I like to point out, uh, we called it the 1918 flu pandemic or the Spanish flu pandemic. But in fact, it lasted three years to the end of 1920 because the virus came back in waves. And we have to anticipate that that situation could happen again. So even if we lift social distancing for periods of months at a time, we might have to reinstitute it uh, at various points. And I think the, the American public needs to be ready for that possibility. Well, I think we have to recognize that this is now our third major coronavirus epidemic pandemic of the 21st century. So we had SARS, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2003. Then we had MERS, the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome in 2012. And now we've got what some people are calling SARS-2. Uh, the COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-2 coronavirus this year. So I think it's important to recognize that we've seen a major new Corona, serious coronavirus uh, causing pneumonia and other severe clinical sequelae every every decade. And this is gonna be maybe the way it's going to be. So I think the nation is gonna to have to look very seriously at building an infrastructure uh, for that purpose, both to monitor coronaviruses very much like we do for flu and then build new technologies like vaccines. Well, at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, our vaccine center, which is called the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, which is co-headed by myself and my science partner of 20 years, Dr. Mary Elena Botazzi, are uh, working very hard to accelerate new vaccines uh, into clinical testing. We've had a coronavirus vaccine program for the last decade, and we've got two vaccines that we're hoping uh, to roll out into clinical trials. And I think what you're going to see is over the next few weeks and months, at least a dozen, maybe more new vaccines enter the pipeline of clinical testing. And then we're gonna to try to move as quickly as we can, as, as long as we can assure uh, that, that we're getting an ad adequate information about the safety of the vaccine. So Dr. Anthony Fauci has charged us with doing this over a year to 18 months. I think that's a, aspirational timeline. I think we should recognize that typically it takes years to develop vaccines, but we're doing our best. Because Houston is a global city, it's one of the most international cities in the country. We're recognizing that COVID-19 does not only affect the United States, it'll be a truly global problem. We're hearing devastating stories of this virus now in Guayaquil and Ecuador, this virus will move into the crowded urban slums of Lagos and Nigeria, of Mumbai and, and India and Dhaka and Bangladesh. And one of the things that we're committed to doing at both at Baylor and Texas Children's, we, of course, we have a huge global health uh, footprint and we're gonna exercise that now to hopefully develop the first global health vaccine for COVID-19.